if I'm not, I, I have a tendency to kind of talk loud. So let me know if I need to tone it down. I won't be embarrassed at all if somebody says tone it down. So, okay. We'll do, and everybody use the chat box to put your questions in, and we'll have Q and A afterwards. But definitely jot jot them down. That sounds good. All right, I've titled this just a catfish story. Normally, whenever I'm giving a presentation, it's kind of you know fairly specific. But this 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 little talk and presentation I put together is kind of just going to go through the fish that are are here. You know somehow they got here and, and some of the issues that we're having now um i have a very dry mouth so i have to have something in my mouth so hopefully that's not going to annoy anybody my name is mary groves and as Bronwyn said i'm with the maryland department of natural resources and i am with the fisheries unit the inland fisheries um and even though it says inland fisheries, we do at least half of our work is on tidal freshwater portions of, of the rivers in my region. Um, my region covers all of Southern Maryland. So that's Anne Arundel County, PG County, Calvert County, St. Mary's and Charles. Um, so we monitor or keep track of basically game fish, but you really can't just, monitor or manage one type of fish without worrying about the forage and everything else so but basically our job isn't isn't like maryland biological stream survey or something like that we're, we're kind of very specific so we're geared more towards game fish and making sure there's a, a good healthy population of fish out there for anglers and just people that like to go out and, and check out the fish so um so it may sound like we're a little bit heavy towards you know like striped bass or you know big catfish or perch or largemouth and then that's why so we're kind of focused mostly on that but like anything else nowadays we're there's more ecosystem-based management which is the way i felt it should have been anyway so um i uh i'm a manager so i i not only do survey work but i also manage the group for the southern region and so the areas that we typically cover in our region is ponds, lakes, um, streams, starting from you know first order streams all the way up to tidal water. And mostly in my region, it is the tidal Potomac and um, the Patuxent River. There's a couple smaller rivers in there, but um, since those tend to be predominantly um, higher in salinity, we don't have as many of the freshwater or brackish water species there. So um, mainly on the river side of it, we're dealing with, you know, the, the bigger rivers. And because I don't have any really big impoundments in my region, I have impoundments, but they're kind of small. We traded off with one of the other regional managers that had some trout work right on, on the border. So he does mostly trout work. So he uh, um, he's taking care of the trout that's in that one area for us, and then we manage and, and monitor Rocky Gorge and Triadelphia as well. So we've got a wide variety of fish that we get to to work with. Um, let's go ahead and see if this changes really good. We're going to start with the small guys. Um, in Maryland, we have like uh, just counting. Let's see. We have six species of fish that that you might normally catch. The top two on here, I don't know. Some people aren't familiar with mad toms at all. They're a really neat little fish. You can tell they're not very big. They only get to be a few a few inches long. Um, we don't see quite as many of the margin mad tom as we do the tadpole. But the interesting thing about these little guys is they pack a big punch. You know, a lot of times people are worried about getting stuck with the spines on a catfish. And mostly the, the problem with any, like if you pick up a bullhead or a channel or something like that, and you get nailed by that spine, either the dorsal spine or the pectoral spine, the very first spine on those fins are hard. It's mostly just because it's actually a puncture and that creates its own problems. There is some, some 
bacterium, whatever on the slime that could cause you to have more of an uh, infection or an allergic reaction with those. But with mag toms, they actually do have venom and it's on their pectoral fins. The very first spine on their pectoral fins does have a venom in it. So it, it, it really is going to hurt a great deal. And, I, and I, I've, I've been hit by those and regular um, like bullheads before. And it was a lot more painful with the mad tom, even so they're so little. And, and then of course, since they are little, those spines are more like needles. Whereas on the bigger catfish, a lot of times they get blunt, and whatever. But it's an interesting little thing that, you know, if somebody says, oh, they're poisonous, they've got venom. They're, they actually do, some catfish actually do. These guys are found a lot more in um, in your smaller smaller waters, streams, um, like the headwaters, first, second order streams. They can be found down in the river if it's, you know, kind of a, a, a clean river, doesn't have a whole lot of movement because these guys don't weigh very much. Um, Something else that's kind of interesting with the mad toms is that um, probably more in the Midwest, but I have seen it here too. People will raise them for, for bait. Not my choice of, of bait for, I don't really want to stick my hand in a bucket with a bunch of those little guys floating around, but, um, but they are good bait for certain species of fish. The next um, that we have on here, and. Is the arrow showing up on you guys if I move an arrow across it to show? Yes, it does, oh, yes, okay. it does show. Oh, good, because there's a couple of places that I kind of need that. So these were our, our mad toms up here. Neat little fish. And if you look at them, like their tails are really kind of wild. They look almost like a, a small bow fin or something because it's, you know, a lot of catfish have either forked or somewhat, you know, somewhat, um, delineated as you know an upper and a lower lobe, but on these guys they don't. But our next ones um, up on the list, and these are these are native to Maryland. I th I don't think I mentioned that these guys are native to Maryland. So um, you know if we do have like a pond or something that somebody impounded from a stream, likely they will have mad toms in that pond. Um, next we have yellow bullhead and brown bullhead, and both can be found in tidal waters, ponds, lakes, non-tidal water. By far the more common bullhead out of the two is the brown bullhead. It can be found in most freshwater areas as well as in our tidal freshwater. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that term. Um, basically tidal freshwater is going to be those waters that that still have a tidal influence, but the, the salinity is, is zero to up to maybe about five parts per thousand. Um, you know, for the majority of that group, it's not even really brackish. It's just, it's just, you know, the tide comes and goes, but you still have, you know, fairly, fairly um, low salinities in it. But brown, bull, brown bullhead do very, very well in tidal fresh waters. And especially in the grass beds when a lot of other fish are, are going a little bit deeper in the summer because oxygen starts to decrease due to whether it's due to algae dying off and, and, and decom decom decomposing, I can't speak tonight. Um, a lot of fish will go into areas where there's more of a current or where there's some, you know, air exchange with the surface of the water, you know, places like you know, coves or whatever that might channel air and get a little bit more oxygen in the water. But brown bullhead, um, as well as most most catfish, aren't as sensitive to, to low oxygen levels. So like in late summer, when you're not seeing much in these grass beds that are starting to change color and die off through the fall, they, they'll be loaded with bullhead. I mean, they're just, it's amazing how many can go in there. and. and I've measured the oxygen levels in some of these grass beds to be two, which is very, very low for fish, and they're still thriving in there. They're far more common than yellow bullhead, and they have been, and people do eat them. I mean, they're frequently called mud cats for a reason, because they do tend to, to scavenge on the bottom. Um, 
but they are edible. And I mean, I, I, when I was in college, I lived not too far from the Potomac River up in Western Maryland. And many times um, when money was tight, we would go out and go fishing for bullheads. Um, sometimes they would taste terribly muddy, particularly after a rain. But um, for, for uh, food, um, people who uh, just like to have fish and there's not that much other species available, and they'll eat it, but it's definitely not one of the preferred ones. And you don't, I don't know that I've ever seen in a store, you know, flayed bullhead, or if it was, they didn't call it that. Um, so those are those, those, those two different species. There is another bullhead that some people have claimed they've seen. Um, we've not seen it, or if we did, it, it wouldn't have been, a, a pure fish, but um, there is a black bullhead as well. And a lot of times when people think they're catching a black bullhead, uh, it's a lot like anything like with the crappie where they look very, very similar or some of the fish in the sunfish family. You know, people were thinking they're getting a black bullhead, but it's it's just a color variation. But it also could be a hy hybrid. Um, that happens more often than I think people realize, particularly with something like smallmouth and largemouth bass. When they're both in one body of water, there's been more than once when we were, you know, really curious as to what particular fish this was because it had, you know, characteristics of both of them. But black bullhead are typically more of a Midwest fish. Um, I'm not saying they, no one's never caught one here, but I'm not seeing one. I'm not seeing one documented. Um, but as we'll find out later on, it's, it's not unusual for strange fish to end up in our waters anyway. If they were there, I, I, they're not gonna really create any issue that I can think of other than they'll probably compete with these other two species. And that's, that's not good, we don't want that either. Next up is our, some of our, starting to get into some of our bigger catfish. And um, actually, on this page. But anyway, um, on this, this slide, I have uh, both white and channel catfish. And I kind of grouped them to together that way because they've got an interesting setup. Like in tidal waters, you could go a certain distance down you know, the, the river and know that you're going to pretty much see channels if you're going to you know, look for catfish. And then at some point, you're gonna see mostly whites. They kind of segregate themselves out on the on the river, but the, the white catfish can handle higher salinities, just a little bit higher salinities than the channel catfish. And I know if you look at literature, sometimes they 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 deal more with hard numbers saying, okay, well, uh, channel catfish can handle up to 11 parts per thousand salinity, white catfish, 10, 10 parts. Well, that doesn't really kind of mesh with what we're seeing out on the water. So those numbers um, are, are kind of fluid when they're talking about salinities, particularly when you're talking about, you know, one, two, three parts per thousand. You know, I, I, it, it, I, I, I'm not happy when I'm dealing particularly with tidal waters being hard and fast with saying they, they can uh, live in a certain range whenever that number isn't always being held up to be quite true. But anyway, white catfish are native to Maryland. Um, they're found in some of our freshwater impoundments as well. Um, and, and most likely they were stocked there because Maryland doesn't really have natural impoundments. Ours have all been blocked and sometimes it's either blocking a, a stream or, um, you know, <laughs> having a, a pond put in a place where there's natural springs underwater or just you know allowing it to to fill by rainwater but in this case you know chances are those were stocked by by somebody when the ponds were first put together so on any of our ponds or small lakes you're gonna the the fish that are in there are likely stocked and that's that's expected really um White catfish also um, is also found in our tidal waters, and it's it's the only larger catfish that is native 
to those rivers. I mean, we do have bullheads that kind of cross over that line too. But um, channel catfish, which most people kind of associate with being, you know, our river catfish, were stocked. They're not native to Maryland. They were stocked back in the um, mid to late 1800s um, by what is now known as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they were doing that to um, help bring a, a, a recreational and food fish to um, some of these river systems. A lot of people don't realize that the river systems were already hurting by then, much like you know, deer populations were getting pretty low by the early 1900s too. So it was part of an effort to increase the number of fish that were in the rivers that, that people could catch and, and consume. Um, they've also been stocked in, in some of our freshwater impoundments, but um, they're in pretty much every tributary that feeds, you know, the Chesapeake Bay. It's just extremely common. Um, now, generally, whenever I'm talking about like all these fish, all the ones that I've talked about so far, they tend to make their nest near cover. Some will, some prefer having like gravel and sandy bottoms to dig a depression. Um, that would be more like the um, more like the mad toms. They want more of a a hard bottom, uh, yellow yellow catfish, kind of the same way. Um, but others like channels and brown bullhead, they'll use the softer bottoms if that's all that's available. And when we're dealing with the tidal water situation, that's pretty much all they've got. I mean, there are some, some sections on any of the rivers that we have that you get surprised where you'll come up with a hard bottom, but a lot of times the, the substrate is shifting, you know, due to whether it's storms or um, currents or whatever. So it's not like you go out there one year and you know you have a real good gravel sandy bottom and it's going to be there forever because it doesn't happen that way. Anyway, so they make a depression under the cover or near the cover and it's, it's twofold for that. First of all, they like that privacy. They, they don't feel quite as vulnerable, but it also keeps the nest from the prevailing currents the eggs are somewhat adhesive, so they kind of stick to whatever's on the bottom, whether it's um, little sticks and stuff that were put in there, or if it's just rock. But they can still come loose if there's just too much of a current. So they try to find cover to, to kind of protect those little depressions a bit. And they also want to shield it from you know any other critters that come along that might want to steal those eggs or the, the babies once they hatch out. And that could be fish or it could be raccoons or anything else. Plus it makes it a little bit easier to defend, you know, if they have that um, branches in there, it, it makes it a lot easier for them. Let me, I had a picture of that too, which uh, I didn't click it right, but that's a, a, that's a fairly good picture. I, I like that. Um, where it's showing, you can see the eggs at the very bottom of the fish. It's actually, that one's kind of piled up kind of high, but that fish has a fairly good way of kind of defending that because they've got at least somewhat of a structure around the sides of it. There's the rock in the front and it just looks like maybe some more grass on the back, but it certainly is better than just having, you know, the depression in the ground and then just dumping the eggs there. Um, something that's kind of, kind of unique. And I did have a couple of pictures of this, but I just could not find them today for some reason, but they're so committed to having cover. I'm sure a lot of you, if, if you're interested in catfish at all, you know, the sport of noodling where uh, people will go into these rivers and put their hands up in holes that are up in these mud banks and pull a, a, a fish out. And normally they're doing that with flathead catfish because they've got really big mouths. And they're doing that like in the Louisiana bayous or down south in Arkansas, Texas. I mean, there's plenty of plenty of places that, that um, have that. Well, we don't really kind of have that type of structure on um, like the Potomac and the Patuxent. Now there's some other rivers that probably might lend itself to noodling, but 
it, it, it's all on the same premise. They're going in those holes to either lay their nest, protect their young or whatever. And in absence of that, we've seen where um, fish will, or the catfish will go into cinder blocks. And it's kind of funny, we had um, this one display one time, we had three cinder blocks stacked one on top of each other. And there were three holes there. And when we came in the next morning after putting the fish in there, there was a catfish sticking its nose out of all three. It was just hysterical. It looked like a catfish apartment. But we've also, when we've tried to spawn out some channel catfish at our hatchery, um, we took any scraps of PVC pipes that were big enough for the fish and just, just pushed them into the bank, um, you know, underwater on the bank. And every one of those were used. And, and our hatchery manager had thrown out his mailbox. So he got his mailbox and he stuck it into the side of the, the pond. And um, sure enough, um, this fish spawned in there. I mean, they're very adaptable. Uh, they're not nearly as picky as some other fish. You know, their basic thing is they just want that cover and someplace where they can feel safe and feel like they have a shot at protecting their babies. But it's, it's cute. I wish I could have found the picture of the cinder block because I had it and, it and it really was funny. I thought it was funny. But anyway, um, most catfish, uh, all the ones that we've spoken of so far, are opportunistic feeder, feeders, and they'll eat whatever is available to them. Additionally, catfish will scavenge for food, utilize, utilizing like pieces of birds or turtles or fish that have, you know, pretty much been torn up by something else, and and part of it's in the water or it dropped in the water from a bird's talons or something but they will eat and, and utilize any of that tissue and, and feed on it. Um, this has issues, particularly when you're talking about something like a brown bullhead or uh, a channel catfish for the simple fact that it, um, sometimes the contaminants that may collect on the bottom of the waterway and then it, it gets into that food and then it's picked up and eaten by you know, the bottom feeder. Um, also, probably even more so, it would be from like the invertebrates, um, catfish like, they like crayfish, they like clams, they like all sorts of small crustaceans, some that, you know, we don't even typically know is there. Those things will feed off of stuff in that environment. They'll pick it up, um, you know, what, whatever contaminant might be there. And then these guys will go ahead and, and, and eat them. So the, the whole bottom feeder thing is not, not the best situation. Um, I know there's been talk on more than one occasion of trying to dredge up some of these materials to get them out of the rivers and stuff. But by now, some of them have been so buried by sediments and whatever that it's really kind of better just to leave them there as long as they're encapsulated. I guess it's kind of like the same idea with, with asbestos or, or something like that. But uh, all it takes is a, you know, a Hurricane Agnes or something like that to start ripping that layer of sediment up again. And then you've got a whole new problem. But anyway, um, Maryland Department of Environment uh, keeps up with testing fish to see what, you know, what the, the consumption limits should be. And, you know, we tell people always try to follow those recommendations that MDE gives, you know, in their reports. And they have a very easy page to look at for the Maryland consumption advisories. So it's a really good thing not to just look at once, but to look at it several times because things change. And um, some tests get more far more sensitive or, you know, there's reason to believe that some areas are going to be different than others. So those numbers or whatever can change from time to time. Something else that's in this picture, I know it kind of looks a little out of it, but this is actually a um, soda bottle or a water bottle. And the, not this catfish, but a little bit bigger catfish um, sucked it down with whatever else it was grabbing out on the bottom. And just the compression from going through its, you know, its system really kind of compacted it. And, and that was there. This is just mud, 
a mud and sand, just literally compacted solid. I think that weighed like a pound and a quarter. Um, it was just in there. And, and again, a lot of times when you see something like this or like big clumps of vegetation, they're going after stuff that's in there. And so they are actually getting some nutrients, but the byproduct of it is just this huge compacted, you know, soap ball. And then on the bottom here, it was an on and off switch from some kind of electronics. So we found some really, really interesting things, you know, when we've done diet studies. It, it's necessary for us, the way that we've gone about doing our diet studies on catfish is to do the actual opening up of the stomach and, and directly examining the food that's in there. And then if we can't identify it, we send it up to a lab and um, have them do DNA work to try to identify it. Um, we've tried um, uh, doing gastric lavage, which is basically pumping the stomach out. Um, and it works perfectly fine. It, 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 there's not a problem with it. And, and we, between cutting them open and doing the gastric lavage, there was a very little difference in the quality and the quantity of, of stuff we were getting from the fish stomachs. But there's so many other things that you can learn from these fish whenever you're actually going in there and doing a, you know, a, an, an actual examination. Um, certainly the best thing would be to be able to send all, it, all of it up to have DNA work, but that's extremely expensive. So we save that just for the ones that we can't get at least, uh, you know, a, a fairly good identification of it. And, um, and then on top of it, you know, we do have, um, we need a fairly large sample for ages in order to, to come up with growth rates to see how different populations compare and whatever. And that requires us to remove the otolith fish. So we have to dispatch them anyway. So we figured since we have to cut them open and get the otolith out anyway, I'd just rather know exactly for sure. Plus you can get, DNA is really good and, I, and, and it has its, its purposes and I'm thankful for it because it's really, we've found fish that were very surprising in these catfish um, that we wouldn't have known if we hadn't done the DNA. But we've also been able to um, get information from the prey itself that we couldn't get if it was DNA work where we get lengths and weights. And sometimes we've been able to even get, you know, some uh, stomach content from the stomach content. So it's, it's actually, it's a little bit more work. People think we're crazy sometimes, but, you know, I, I think it's, for us, it works good for right now. I don't want to do that forever because I still have almost 2000 odor lists to read. So, so it can get a little bit, a little bit much after a while. All right, we're going to move on to our invasive species. You know, we pretty much cover what, what's not invasive and move on to blue catfish. And, and this, as far as invasive species, we have far more information on blue catfish than we do on flatheads at this time because blue catfish kind of came in like a lion. I mean, it just, you know, really steamrolled us as far as how quickly it, it, it spread and and grew and whatever. And flatheads have their own issues and there's there's concerns for that particular species too. But but the blue catfish is the one that's really kind of taken over um, as far as the invasive uh, king right now. So we've got more information coming from them. They were first introduced, they're a Midwest a Mississippi River fish. I'm sure most people know that. I mean, they get huge. They can get up to 150 pounds. Um, don't typically get up to 150 pounds, but 80 and 90 pounds is not an issue. I mean, our state record is over 80 pounds. Virginia's is higher than that. Um, but early on in when they move into a river system, they can get up to 40, 50, 60 pounds very quickly because they have plenty of food. And if you're out used to catching little bluegills or little catfish or whatever, and you hook into a 40 pound fish, that's going to be quite, quite a exciting thing for, for you, especially with, with kids. But anyway, they were um, stocked, um, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fish stocked um, blue, 
blue catfish and their tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay sometime in the 70s. And they did it for a, a new game fish opportunity and it succeeded quite well. They, they, they became world renowned for their, their um, catfish populations, the blue catfish and the James and Rappahannock. And there's several other smaller streams that come off of these big, big rivers. And it's interesting. Um, I'll just throw it in here quickly. I won't really talk about it too much, but but catfish, you, it's not like you can sample the James River and then extrapolate what you need to do management wise to other rivers because they are so they their populations are so in tune with what's in that particular river, and not all the rivers have all the same forage base or 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 currents or everything else. So you really do have to treat them almost individually. It's it, it's kind of a frustrating thing. But anyway, the James was really the the fish or the the river that people um came to the most. And they very quickly um there were guides that were coming out and starting up um businesses and it's really it it it's taken off. Um by the mid, I'd say mid 1990s, some blue catfish started showing up in Maryland tidal waters. Um, now remember, it's been like 20 years, and it took 20 years. And if you know, we were like, well, maybe these are new fish, maybe these are ones that somebody's stalking, and not necessarily from from the Virginia fish. But we found over the years that it takes roughly about 20 years in most cases, at least in the bigger river systems for these um, these populations to really take off if there there's none around them at all, and um, I I don't understand quite why they've they've really blasted through some of these other river sister systems in Maryland because I didn't think they had been there for close to twenty years, but maybe they were, and we just didn't pick up on it because you have to have a good number of fish um, in the water for you to pick it up with electrofishing equipment and the way that we're sampling. So, um, you know, if there's something that needs to be changed to try to pick them up quicker, I don't know what it is, but certainly letting the public know about it helps. And, and I'll get into that a little bit later too. So um, they become pretty much, you know, in the Potomac River, they're, they're there. Um, fortunately, Great Falls has block their progression north on the Potomac. Um, barring a very dry year, blue catfish can occupy more than two thirds of the tidal river. They also inhabit deep tributaries like the Wicomico River on the Maryland side of the river. And what that means is, you know, in years of normal rainfall or maybe a little bit, you know, a periodic heavier rainfall, the salinities are low enough in the Potomac River that these fish can swim just about the entire length. Originally, the very early on data or, or papers and, and studies said they don't really handle anything over 10 parts per thousand salinity. And we know now that's not true. They can handle higher salinities. I think the official, the official upper reach is 14, which is still not that high. But that's just meaning that they can't really reproduce and function long term in that in that area. They can, however, live for short periods of time and much higher salinity. So if if there's a halfway decent rainfall, you know that's that's we've been experiencing, and the salinity is down low a little bit anyway. Once they get down to that area, like at the mouth of um, you know. A point lookout or whatever, um, even if those salinities haven't been affected by the rain, you know, and they're 14, 15, 16, um, for short periods or short distances, um, blue catfish can move around those and get into, you know, areas with, with lesser salinity. So they're pretty, um, they're pretty adaptable as far as that goes. Um, so the next place that we've got these little guys coming to is the Patuxent River. And um, not all movement, you know, I'm, I'm saying that they're moving and I'm kind of 
taken this as, you know, we're, we're moving on up the, the tributaries. But we do know from dealing very closely with some people back, particularly like from 2000 to 2010 or 12, we had some very, very enthusiastic people who loved fishing for these big blue catfish and they would go down to Virginia and that was costing a lot of money, taking a lot of time for them to go down there. So when this fish, when these blue catfish started popping up in good numbers in the Potomac, you know, and they didn't have to drive quite as far as the James or the Rapidan or the Rappahannock or whatever, you know, they were excited because they, they had these fish a lot closer to home. Well, that caught on. So there's, there's a period of time around 2004, 2005, where these, some of these um, fishing groups were extremely active. And of course, when you grow quick and you're, you've got a lot of really enthusiastic actors in there, um, you're going to have troubles. And so, um, you know, we had a pretty good idea that some of these fish were moved and people who were involved in moving it actually ended up telling us in a couple places. So, so even though the fish can move into some of these areas, part of why they probably didn't take the 20 years is they were getting, they were getting the Johnny Appleseed treatment, which happens quite frequently. People don't think it's a big deal to move fish from one place to the other without realizing just how much damage that could cause. So, um, Northern Snakehead kind of did the same thing. But in response to this, we um, launched a very aggressive information campaign to inform the public of the dangers of moving fish around without a permit. I mean, if there's, people can move some fish like in their own pond or whatever, they do have to get a permit, but, but it's necessary to know where fish are, where the potential um, break in the line is where they might end up in public waters. But anyway, and they, uh, we, we told them the dangers of it to the, you know, to the environment, and then also let them know, you know, it's illegal. You can't do that. So, and, and they would be prosecuted if they were found. Um, and the repercussions of what happens when these fish get into these systems can't be can't be reversed. So it's, it's pretty important. And I mean, and it truly can't be <laughs> reversed. When we had snakeheads for showing up in the Potomac, I can't tell you how many people had contacted my office and wanted to know why we couldn't just poison the Potomac like we did in Crofton when we had the snakeheads there, you know, and, and it's like, uh, yeah. do you have any clue as to how much water is there? I mean, just, just the idea of, of purchasing a chemical and putting it out there, it just really couldn't be done. But on top of it, that's unethical. You just can't do that. So, but, but people try to help. They try to come up with ideas, but I don't think people really realize just how much, how much is out there, how much water is there. But anyway, um, so we had these outreach events and we tried to have them in places where, you know, the highest number of people were going to see them, you know, public parks. We even had, um, we've had more than one event where we have people tasting like blue catfish because people are like, I'm not eating that, you know, and, and you know, they, they either ate bullhead when they were younger and didn't realize this is different or whatever. But it was it was good because there was a lot of people that had their minds changed. The the fish actually did taste good. So, you know, if they could go out there and they could catch it, they're helping the environment. Plus, they're getting a good meal out of it. That's a that's a win win as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so we had also we tried to appeal to legislative um, representatives, TV newscasters. We did have quite a bit of press covering it and. Um, mainly just to let people know what the, the damage that these guys can do and to, to try to reduce the impact that they might have on, um, you know, the resident fish and, and other animals that are in the water. So now we come to the flathead. Um, so at this point, when we're dealing, starting to deal with flathead, we've got the Potomac Scott blue crab or blue catfish, 
toxin has blue catfish. There's some rumblings that they're over on the Chop Tank River, but we hadn't had it confirmed yet. And then we knew that we were having some flatheads in the mix as well, because the same group that was fishing down the Potomac, there was a huge, huge number of small clubs that all had these tournaments. They were fishing up there too and bringing us pictures of flatheads. So we knew that was, that was definitely the case. Flathead catfish, it's interestingly enough, they've been stocked in the Occoquan Bay for since since about 1970. And, and that's in the tidal Potomac on the Virginia side. And they hadn't moved out of there. I mean, they were there for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, we used to do a lot of um, fishing shows, like at the Harrisburg Show and Bass Expo up in Timonium. And we would put up a big, you know, 120 gallon fish tank and try to put all fish that, you know, we wanted to represent in Maryland in there, but we were also trying to teach the public about um, the invasives and how to identify them because we wanted them not to put them back in the water if they could help it. And um, we always knew we could go over to the Occoquan Bay and, and grab us a flathead. A lot of times it's kind of hard to determine, especially in the summer, if you're gonna get the fish that you need for this display. And we tried to get one of each, kind of small. But boy, we could go over the Occoquan and always get our, our flathead, which was really kind of wild. They didn't come out. It was like there's a fence there. But that didn't last very long. By the late 1990s, 2000s, we're starting to see more and more of them on the tidal Potomac. But we don't think it was from those Aquaquam fish. And, and act, actually, um, we're pretty sure that it was from stockings farther upriver. And, and we share a river with West Virginia and Virginia and different places. But Maryland actually owns the river uh, all the way over to the... Um, mean high tide or the mean tide, not even tide, the mean water line on the Virginia and West Virginia side. But I think people still think, well, it's part of our river too, so we're gonna stock it. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened. We didn't stock it. But so flatheads are now on the upper Potomac too. And their chances are the ones that we're seeing lower in the river are coming from those. The biggest flathead population however, occurs on the upper bay. Um, it's in the Susquehanna and Susquehanna um, Flats region. These fish are fed by, uh, um, these fish are fed by uh, a reproducing population of flatheads on, on the Pennsylvania side of Conowingo. Um, they do have flatheads up there. Uh, Jeff Smith, the biologist, just in that region has been trying for years to come up with some kind of a management plan that could help reduce numbers of flatheads there as well. Um, but it, basically they're still collecting some data. Uh, but uh, that, that population really took off and they can come down through, through the dam, not, not through the turbines, but there are a couple ways that fish can actually come down river and that's what's been happening. So they're feeding, the, it fed pretty much the Susquehanna and then the fish have moved out from the Susquehanna into the flats and then the Northeast and the Elk River. So that's another spot where we're gonna, you know, see a good number of flatheads. Plus there's blue catfish there too. Not as numerous, but it's overlap uh, the area. The biggest, um, let's see. So I, I just thought this picture here of this head on the, of the um, flathead was kind of cool looking. They're actually a neat fish and they can get over a hundred pounds too, but these pictures don't quite do them justice. I mean, if you were to see one in person, you would notice that it was definitely something different from what you would normally see because their, their head is flat. This, this part, it doesn't even really show it as well in this picture. These are Dwayne Raver drawings and he does a really good job, but but they, to me, they are, they're even flatter. And then their mouth is incredibly wide. So they can eat a lot of fish. Um, they tend to really hit hard on the sunfish populations and any of the um, suckers that are in the river, which if you have anything like a Northern Pike, chain pickerel, walleye, um, muskies, tiger muskies, they, they really like those fusiform shapes of the suckers 
and in areas where flatheads have really been in heavy concentrations, you know, the number of suckers decline and then the numbers of those other fish can decline as well. But they're an interesting looking fish. I mean, what I started to say was that they're basically more of a cinnamon color and then they have sprinkles on them like somebody put darker um, cinnamon on them and they, they're, they're actually kind of pretty. But anyway, so this, this map is just to show a little bit of, try to give an idea of what's going on. Um, so we had, we have blue catfish down here. That's where they started. And then they moved up into the Patuxent River here. And then we started noticing the red is uh, flathead catfish. And then the green here is both flathead and uh, blue catfish. So there's a couple areas here that are just, just blue catfish. And then this gray area, we added that just recently because that's covering almost every other tributary that we have to the bay. These are very short watersheds. So they don't typically hold huge populations. And then they're more likely to be affected by high rainfall or low rainfall. I mean, most of the time up in this area, you know, you don't even get salinities in a dry year, but you can. And I, there have been times when we had salinities that were up a little bit higher. Of course, the lower you go down in the bay, the higher the salinities are going to be. But with these short, short places here, it's easy to see how just a pretty good spring rain or a couple of them could get these fish to go up in there. They're going to be pretty clear. So the gray is indicating where we're pretty sure there are at least blue catfish, but it's not been 100% documented. I mean, the chop tank by now it has, or the Chester, I can't, that's the Chester. That's definitely been documented and the chop tank has definitely been documented. I just didn't change that, the map for that. And then there's just one little addition here. If you look at it and then I click it, it's got this added section here and that's to show that we have both flathead and blue catfish in that region now too. Um, I'm sorry, the map, these, these words, the river names are just really small. And I thought it came across a lot cleaner than that. But, but I told you, you know, basically what was important about the map. So if you can't read it, it's not too terribly bad. So <laughs> that's kind of how our progression has looked if we're, we're trying to keep track of it. Um, because, because of the sheer size alone of blue cats and flathead catfish and the damage that they can cause to other catfish populations, I'm not seeing a real big change in the bullheads so much, but white catfish populations in different areas have definitely declined. And, and I'll, I'll have something that shows that really well here in a minute. But we knew even though i'm not we're not catfish we're, we're not mandated to deal with catfish um and certainly not to work in the more estuarine parts of the rivers we're freshwater so basically our our, our territory is five parts per thousand at salinity and less but because of the size of these things and how fast they grew and how fast they took off we we needed to get some information before somebody told us to do it or before the state could even get stuff going. So we've done several things. And in the Potomac River, we did a diet study back in 2008. It wasn't even, that was on top of our regular job. No one else told us to do it. We just did it because we knew it needed done. So we would do length and weight of the fish, pull O lists, age them so we can get a growth rate. And of course we found out that the Potomac fish grew a lot faster than the ones that were down in Virginia, but that's because the Virginia populations were 20, 30 years old. The Potomac was only a few years old. So it had tons of food, tons of cover, no competition. And so they grew very, very well. And we had, like I said, plenty of 60, 70 pounders you know, that were caught out of that river with no problem very quickly. And the state record even just kept getting broke like year after year. There was like a two or three year um, 
period where the state record for blue catfish was broken. Right now it stands at 84 pounds, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's a big fish. So <clears throat> we, uh, we wanted to try to figure out what, what we could do to um, try to reduce the detrimental effect that these guys could have on our other fish. And two ways to lessen it, you know, is to one, encourage anglers to catch and keep the fish, preferably to eat them. You know, we don't like to see them where people, you know, will catch fish and just throw it up on the, on the um, parking lot. That's not, that's not cool. Nobody likes to see that. Um, ooh, am I going too long? No, we're good. Okay, okay. And then the, and so we've tried to do that. Every chance we've got, we've tried to tell anglers, please take the fish. You know, if you don't like eating them, give them to your neighbor. Um, as a matter of fact, I wanted to put this in here too, because this, this, is, this is something that's been very important throughout this whole project is we don't like wasting anything. And we have, we have had to bring thousands and thousands of pounds of these fish to our office to cut them open, examine them, all this other stuff. But not one of those fillets ever went to waste. We, um, in some cases early on, we did all the filleting and we were able to give food to like food banks. Um, there's local, local folks that um, look out for their entire community. So they would come out and have three or four guys that would volunteer to, to clean fish and take it home to the people in their community that needed food. Um, so nothing was wasted. And, and that's how we've also kind of built up this, this, um, this, you know, this good relationship with the community in our area where they know that the fish are good to eat. I mean, the, the, we've been giving it to them. I mean, giving you samples for free is definitely the best way to go. But these were like, like I said, we, most of the time the packs were like in two or three pound packs. And we were just, we've been able to get rid of every single fish that we have studied and um, not wasted any of it. And we've never had anybody say, oh, they're horrible. <laughs> you know, they liked them. As a matter of fact, we've made some converts for sure. The second way that we, we could do anything to help is to provide technical guidance to commercial watermen. Um, people have been um, fishing commercially on the Chesapeake Bay for, you know, for years. And mainly their catfish that they were catching and, and turning in for food was channel catfish, white catfish, although there's not that much meat on a white catfish, they're all head. I'm sure they snuck some bullheads in there from time to time, but predominantly it's been mostly channel catfish and then some, some white catfish too. So um, both these methods have drawbacks. Many people are concerned about eating large fish from the wild. They're concerned about the chemical and other pollutants in the water. And that gives people pause when including wild caught catfish in their diets. Fortunately, these two species are not bottom feeders and the sense that they aren't scavengers like other catfish species. They feed predominantly on fish and invertebrates. I mean, we have seen so many crayfish in these guys, and that's a great food for for you know for any fish. I mean, it's really good for them health wise. This results in a very clean tasting meat. As long as you take out the dark meat on the side of the fish, and you should do that with every species, they're very very clean clean meat, and you could do just about anything you want with them. Um, additionally, consumption advisories for these, um, these fish caught in Maryland, are they're more lenient, lenient with the blue catfish. I had said that earlier, you know, you can eat more of them than you can like channel catfish or, or white catfish because they don't carry as much of the pollutants or toxins in them. Um, the Maryland Department of Environment is currently looking at flathead tissue. They hadn't had called to do that before because most of the fish that were being caught for food was was blue catfish but now they're turning to flatheads as well and um and we're seeing a higher harvest harvest rate for flatheads in recent years secondly in order to help the commercial watermen um they need to know where to find the fish it's kind of easy to locate them in the spring and the summer but come late fall winter they were having trouble finding out where these blue catfish go 
So one of the things we did, we did several tracking studies to try to find out where these fish are going in the winter time and different parts of the year. It actually lasted more than a year. We were really only planning on doing three seasons, but we ended up doing four because our receivers were still working well and we saw you know, anomalies with what other literature had said. So, you know, our fish don't necessarily work like fish in the Mississippi drainage. A lot of times their fish would head upstream to spawn and then go downstream and sit in deep water. Ours kind of did the opposite. And if anybody's really interested in that study, I could send them, you know, I think we have a summary right now. It's not a flat out report, but but it is a summary, but it was an interesting project as well. Um, but what we're doing and what we did was we tagged 77 um, blue catfish and followed them for that year. And one of our outcomes was we were able to locate where these guys are most likely going to be as in the wintertime when the watermen are having trouble finding them. And also um, at what level and in what year, um, a lot of times they use all sinks and that's probably not practical in the winter where these guys are basically sitting. Um, they're going to do much better with like jugs or alternative gear. So um, as long as we can get information to people that can help remove some of these fish, we're not going to get rid of them all. It's kind of like snakeheads. They're not, they're not going anywhere. We have them, but um, we could try to just lessen the impact that they're going to have. Um, both flatheads and blue catfish are listed as invasive species in Maryland um, and have the potential to negatively impact our resident fish. We know that. However, <laughs> they do provide an exciting and appealing recreational opportunity that wasn't previously here for these big fish. The large blue catfish um, that are caught in Virginia and Maryland attracts national attention by, um, by anglers and have created this boom for fishing tackle, gears, boats, lures, and for enterprising people in the region that have decided to either put a club together or um, you know, do these tournaments. Not to mention guides. There's a lot more guides out on the water that are specializing just in catfish. Um, By the growing invasive catfish population, um, oh, I, I said that wrong, that these guides have been, their numbers are increasing because the number of catfish are increasing. And when they were mostly focused in Virginia, we've got quite a few here in Maryland now too. And they do not, they're not happy with us trying to get rid of fish. But, you know, it, it took two or three years of me going out to some of the tournaments and, and several talks to tell them, look, they're not going anywhere. And if we don't, we don't allow the, the watermen to remove, you know, these, these fish, because a lot of times they're going for the mid-sized fish, you're just going to have a bunch of stunted small fish out there. Like it's happened in a couple um, tributaries in Virginia where all the big fish are gone now. And now they just have zillions and zillions of these small guys that nobody wants to fool with. So there's a, there is a good reason for harvesting fish. Even if you have a, a private pond, you don't want to just leave the fish alone. You have to take some fish out in order for the other ones to grow. Um, anyway, uh, this is a picture of one of the um, tournaments. It was put on by Coastal Conservation Association. They normally deal a lot with yellow perch, but um, they saw that the blue catfish were having a feast on just about anything they could find. And yes, we found yellow perch and white perch in their stomachs. So um, they decided they wanted to do their part and they've had a couple tournaments of uh, to catch these and, and pull them out of the water. And some of the guys took their fish home with them. They had a fish fry that day too, which smelled really good. But they also um, donated some to food banks, which makes everyone feel good. You know, they feel like they're doing something. If we've got to kill these guys, then at least they're, they're going to a, a good purpose. And this guy was really tickled with his fish. <laughs> He's a cute little guy. Anyway, so... 
So in the end, the commercial harvest is the easiest and likely most productive way to reduce the number of unwanted fish in our region. There was a time when we would electrofish the Patuxent River and all these tiny little, you know, thousands of little fish would be um, either bullheads or in most cases cha uh, channels, but these are all blues. And we can go on the Potomac and the Patuxent after the spawn and just, there's just gazillions of them. They're all over the place. And they're kind of a pain in the neck to net too, because if you pull them up with your net, those little spines love to just get tangled up in the net. So we've had to go to rubberized nets just so that we weren't spending all day trying to get their, their uh, spines out of there. Um, Unfortunately, I, I have seen, and that's the guys and I, in our crew, we have seen a decline in the number of white catfish um, in the river. Uh, apparently once blue catfish come in, the white catfish just disappear. And it's not necessarily that they're, they're dying or getting eaten, they're moving out. But that disruption is going to cause stress, can cause um, a premature dying of these fish whenever they can't get to what they need when they need it. Um, and that's not just us. Uh, the, actually, I think it was probably ang anglers who even brought that up to us before we noticed it. But um, we need to have a better handle on some of these other species, like, like white perch and stuff, to truly see what kind of damage these guys are doing to those populations. It's gonna be hard to do that for some place like the Potomac or the Patuxent because we've already been out there. Or the fish have been there for a while. That's why identifying areas, new areas where these fish are is important because then it, we can target those areas to go in and get some baseline data on the other fish species. Two of the things, it's funny, gizzard shad's one of them that we know are getting hit really hard and white perch. And both of those have been like incredibly abundant in the bay. But then again, passenger pigeons were at one time too. So, you know, it's, it's it, you know, we've, we've always said, you're never gonna get rid of gizzard shad. And, and now I'm like, well, may that, that may not be true. So everything has its place and its importance. Um, these are just some of the signs that we put out there in, in our different projects to help people identify mainly, um, the flathead and the blue catfish, because if we are asking people to kill them or to take them home, we want to make sure that they're doing the right fish. And I, and it's not just catfish. I mean, people, people will mistake catfish, like a walleye as a catfish or other things. When, when we ask people to kill snakeheads, you know, to not return them live. I mean, it was just, hard to get people to really pay attention to what what they look like that's why we took as many of the invasive species with us live to shows so that people could see what they look like because we have people killing tons of blennies gobies walleye eel and in two cases i have yet to see a live bowfin in in the potomac river or the upper bay which is two places that they are I've seen them with other people catch them in or whatever, but I have, I've been doing this for 30, 33 years. I've never seen a live bowfin, but within a week of us asking people to kill snakeheads, instead of putting them back in the water, we got people taking pictures of bowfin that people killed thinking that they were snakeheads. So where sometimes it may look like we're overkill on the signs and stuff. It really is there for a reason to try to help people as much as possible. And I'm almost done. Um, I, I just wanted to throw this chart in here because this is really showing you how, how much of a difference um, just 10 years have made. Um, this is, these are commercial landings for watermen in the Potomac River proper. The Potomac River proper is run by the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. It's not run by Maryland or Virginia. It's, it's representatives from both Maryland, Virginia, and DC, but it's an independent thing because of all the turf wars that have gone on there. So they actually, they tally their own numbers for the main stem. Maryland does it for the Maryland Trib side. Virginia does it for the Virginia Trib side. 
I didn't do the other two. I didn't do the rest of Maryland or the Upper Bay. I just did this on the Potomac River just so that you could see. It went from 225,000, almost 226,000 um, fish for on the um, uh, caught in 2010 to over 2 million. That's a lot of fish. And I know in Virginia alone, not in the, the tidal Potomac, but there are other river systems They've, they've exceeded 2 million for years. That's how many fish are there. And then the CC is channel catfish. And we went from 83,000 down to 16,000. White cat, which is the worst on here, is 26, almost 2,700 fish, which still isn't a lot, but it went down to 107. And then brown bullhead, um, actually this is showing in 220, it's a big drop too. I have the numbers for 221. I just haven't put it in here yet. And then flatheads are just, you know, just starting to show up in those numbers. So um, that was just to give you an idea of, of the numbers that are being pulled out. And we're still seeing lots and lots and lots of, lots of fish. So I, if there's time, you know, and you want to, I'd be happy to try to answer questions um i just had some fun. yeah very if you can unshare and come back together that was an amazing presentation thank you so much okay did that do we, work? Uh, mary, yeah mary yes it did mary's uh uh, uh mary's camera is not working but if you do if you have a question you can raise your hand and i'll call on you or you can put it in the chat box and we'll um, and we'll let um, Mary answer that question. It, it, I know that um, I am so much smarter now for having uh, seen this this uh, this uh, presentation. Let's see. Yes, I agree. I need a very interesting. Any questions? So do we see the white catfish um, populations growing anywhere or they're just de decreasing? They're either decreasing or staying pretty much the same, but no, I'm not, I'm not noticed. But the problem is, is we don't have a program that's out documenting what those, um, what those populations are looking like on a yearly basis, unfortunately. So we have to use like either older data or um, where an area where we're seeing like maybe an increase in flatheads or blues get in there and try to do uh, some kind of a population estimate or something on the white, white cap. So we can see if, you know, what the direct impact is. I mean, we're in a really weird situation because we have we had um blue catfish come in you know before the turn of the century and then at the you know 2005 we had snakeheads come in too and so you have these two very predaceous creatures and one can grow very very large and i mean the snakehead's nothing to sneeze at either size wise it's kind of hard to tell you know if one or both or neither of them are causing an impact if it's something else totally. I can't honestly say, you know, say to somebody, no, they're they're not having an impact. They they have to. I mean, just by the sheer size of the fish, the number of fish, and I mean, these are healthy. I mean, we're not seeing skinny um, catfish. They're all the ones that we brought in. The only time we have like a skinny or a fish that looks unusual is when we can cut it open and there's actually tumors and stuff in it so it, it would have to be a really sick fish otherwise they're they're in good shape hmm. well i am so glad that you're out there to keeping track of everything that's going on um and taking the initiative even when when when, when new problems um arise um any other questions for Mary tonight. I know that the person I want to go fishing with 
is Mary. She knows where all the fish are. <laughs> and so she's a good person to go, go fishing with. So maybe we'll all have to go on a fishing trip with Mary uh, sometime soon. But thank you so much, Mary, for all that you do. Um, and thank you for feeding our, feeding our minds. Uh, we'll be out there uh, fishing and uh, sharing this data and this information with others. Thank you, you are so very much. welcome. If anybody need, you know, wanted more information or thought of something later on, my um, my email is is on the website for the state. It's and it's if you look up like the uh, catfish, it's listed there as well. They have me down as the catfish contact person, so it's kind of easy to find. Or yeah. if you have it, you can even pass that along. I, I'd be happy to pass it on if anybody wants to, to get in touch with Mary for any, any other uh, questions. Um, she is a wealth of information, and I'm so glad that uh, we were able to tap into it. And everybody, stay well, stay curious. I hope I see you all next week uh, as we move forward and keep learning together. So stay well and stay curious, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.